to go ahead and stand up. Uh, we're going to join together and uh, sing Grace Greater Than Our Sin.
that grace? Amen. We're going to open up tonight with a word of prayer. I'm going to ask uh, Brother Joe, would you pray for us tonight? Amen. You can be seated. Uh, I want to go over just a handful of announcements before we have our uh, prayer request uh, time. Uh, we do have a junior activity the 17th, uh, this upcoming Saturday. Uh, and um, Brother Nick has asked me to remind all the uh, parents or guardians or whatever, if you uh, know of a child that's going, uh, would you please make sure that they're uh, signed up so that Brother Nick can... Uh, make preparation for that. Uh, the sign-up sheet out there in the foyer, uh, if you could do that before you leave this evening. April the 18th, uh, King's Daughters will meet after the morning worship service. That's this upcoming weekend. April the 24th is the mother-daughter luncheon. Uh, that is, uh, it starts at 11.30. Uh, there's a sign-up sheet for that as well. If you have any questions about it, uh, you can see uh, Miss Amy Coates or uh, Miss Amber Vasquez, which Oddly enough, neither one of them were able to be here tonight, Brother, uh, Brother Mark having had surgery, and uh, uh, one of the kids at uh, the Vasquez home has the stomach bug, and so you'll have to ask them this weekend, amen, uh, or you can call them, text them, whatever, uh, uh, but uh, remember that, April the 25th, uh, baptism uh, that Sunday evening uh, at, uh, at the end of our evening service, and then May the 2nd, church membership at the end of our evening service. Uh, we still have our sign-up sheet in the foyer to uh, sign up for church cleanup, and so if you'd like to participate in that, we encourage you to do so. Um, other than that, that is the end of our uh, announcements. Uh, so uh, we'll go ahead and uh, take up our uh, Wednesday evening uh, prayer request. Obviously, we're remembering uh, Brother Mark, who's recovering well. Uh, his son's here this evening and said he was out walking around, or up walking around and doing uh, everything that he can, and so uh, praise the Lord for that. Um, I'll ask you to remember uh, Whitney. She's had that stomach bug for um, uh, all day Monday, all day uh, Tuesday, and she still had a little bit today, and so uh, if you would please remember her, and uh, there's a good amount of other folks that are dealing with that stomach bug. Like I said, uh, uh, Miss Amber Vasquez, uh, a couple of kids in her home uh, have it, and so um, we'll remember them as well. Um, we'll start out on this side tonight. Any uh, prayer requests on this side this evening? All right. Well, Y'all are easy. Amen. How about on this side? Any prayer requests? Yes, ma'am. All right. Bob Dawson, you said? Okay. Uh, any others on this side tonight? Yes, ma'am. Brian and Abby uh, this evening. Um, any others? Uh, he's doing better, uh, getting better all, all the time. He, uh, um, he calls me or texts me at least once a day. He's ready to get back in church and uh, things of that nature. And so just uh, keep him in your prayers and um, pray that he... Uh, is able to get back doing what he wants to do. Amen. Um, any others? All right. I'm going to ask uh, Brother Mac, would you uh, lead us in prayer tonight, pray over these uh, requests?
Amen. Amen. All right, I'm going to ask you to take your Bibles, if you will, turn to the book of Luke, chapter number 7. Luke chapter number 7, as we're continuing our uh, study through the parables that Jesus gave. And so, um, this evening, Luke chapter 7, act, the parable we're going to look at is actually only uh, two verses, verses 41 and 42, so it's very short. But in order to completely understand its meaning and its application, we need to look at the events that brought about uh, the reasoning for Jesus uh, sharing or giving uh, and teaching this parable. Um, and so, uh, Luke chapter number 7, we're going to start reading in verse 36. And one of the Pharisees desired him that he would eat with him. And he went into the Pharisee's house and sat down to meet. And behold, a woman in the city, which was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus had sat at meat in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment and stood at his feet behind him, weeping, and began to wash his feet with tears, and did wipe them with her hairs of her head, and kissed his feet, and anointed them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisees had bidden him, saw it, he spake within himself, saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would have known who and what manner of woman this is that toucheth him? For she is a sinner. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Simon, I have somewhat to say unto thee. And he saith, Master, say on. There was a certain creditor which had two debtors. The one owed 500 pence and the other 50. And when they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him most? Simon answered and said unto him, I suppose that he to whom he forgave most. And he said unto him, Thou hast rightly judged. And he turned to the woman and said unto Simon, Seest thou this woman? I entered into thine house, thou gave me no water for my feet. But she hath washed my feet with her tears and wiped them with the hairs of her head. Then gavest me no, or thou gavest me no uh, kiss, but this woman, since the time that I came in, hath not ceased to kiss my feet. My head with oil thou didst not anoint. But this woman hath anointed my feet with ointment. Wherefore I say unto thee, her sins, which are many, are forgiven. For she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. And he said unto her, thy sins are forgiven. And they that sat at meat with him began to say within themselves, Who is this that forgives sin also? And he said unto the woman, Thy faith hath saved thee. Go in peace. We see here in verses 41 and 42 this very small parable that Jesus, uh, that Jesus gives, but it's in, in reference to a Pharisee that had invited him into his home. Now, you remember last week we looked at how after the conversion of Matthew, after Matthew decided that he would go and, and follow Jesus as Jesus had bid him to follow him, uh, that he uh, set up a, a get-together, a party, a celebration for, uh, for the, uh, the soul purpose of uh, giving glory and honor to Jesus Christ and celebrating the decision that he had made. The Pharisees came and they questioned and they um, uh, doubted and Jesus uh, had shut their mouth with a parable. And here we see that this Pharisee desired Jesus to come to his house. He asked if he would come eat with him, and when uh, he went to the Pharisee's house, uh, he went there for the purpose of eat, uh, of eating with him. And uh, we see in the uh, in the first handful of verses the people uh, that were in attendance. Now uh, we know that there were more Pharisees than just the one that had invited, because we can see that close to the end of the parable. We also recognize uh, uh, the the probability of there being. 
uh, his family there and stuff like that. But uh, the, the, the three individuals that make up the majority of this story and that are referenced even in Jesus' parable are, first of all, the self-righteous Pharisee. Now, he didn't... His willingness to dismiss Jesus after, after everything that happens and as he questions, look, if, if he was really a prophet, he would know the kind of person that was touching him and he would know the kind of things that are, uh, that are going to be said about that and he would refuse that. And uh, so uh, we can recognize from that and other portions of Scripture uh, that, that this wasn't a person who was legitimately seeking uh, an understanding or a relationship with Jesus. It was for a uh, purpose uh, 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 the purpose is unrevealed to us, but we, we do know that he was a Pharisee, one that uh, did what he could to prove himself righteous and to prove to others uh, that he was worthy of God's perfect heaven. And so uh, he is the, the self-righteous Pharisee that's mentioned here. Uh, we also see the Savior, Jesus Christ himself, who uh, I love the fact that when he was asked to go, it wasn't just by those like Matthew who had chosen to follow him that Jesus was willing to, uh, to go with and to, uh, to spend time with. It was also those that Jesus knew were going to reject him. We can see it in here. We can see it in Judas who, who ate at the Last Supper and whose feet were washed. And we'll look at that in a while too. But uh, he was a part of this as well. And so uh, we recognize that, that the Savior is here, that he's been willing to come as the self righteous Pharisee has invited him to the house, but it was it was customary in those days when, when having a guest over, especially with religious leaders and Pharisees, it was kind of an open door policy. And we see that a sinner makes her way into the crowd and into the home. And as Jesus is there, as he is sitting and he is eating and they are uh, uh, talking over some things, we see that uh, verse 37, and behold, a woman in the city, uh, which was a sinner, uh, was there also. And when the, the Pharisee called into question uh, the, the fact that you know, whether or not Jesus was, was a prophet or was a righteous man at all, uh, as he insinuated, uh, the reality is this sinner that's made reference to here, first of all, was a woman, which was uh, in their customs uh, uh, an absolute no-no. Was, she was also a Gentile, which was uh, the worst of the worst in their society and so was shunned, and she was a sinner. And this, this word that's used sinner here is one that is, she was recognized in the community for her living a life of sin. Uh, uh, this word sinner in its translation could be, uh, could be uh, uh, interchanged with, uh, uh, with a harlot or a prostitute. And so she was a woman that was recognized for her living a sinful life and most likely a, uh, a life of, uh, of ill repute, of you are a, a life that was disdained by most. And that's why the Pharisee said, look, how can this person be a prophet if he's allowing that kind of person not only to be in his presence, uh, but to even touch him. We get to the picture of adoration. Now this parable that he's going to speak, uh, uh, he ends with, uh, with, uh, with a question. Which of them will love most? And so uh, with that being said, we see this picture of adoration this person who was recognized as a sinner, who was probably living uh, this, this horrible uh, life that everyone knew about and that, uh, that everyone avoided and that uh, was, a, was a mockery and uh, uh, avoided at all costs. The Bible says in verse 37, when she knew that Jesus had sat at me with the, at the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment. We see her seeking out Jesus. When she knew that he was there, she brought an alabaster box of ointment. Now, this alabaster box of ointment, there's, uh, there's much debate over its cost and its value, and, and we'll see that it's broken, and really that's a phrase that means that just the, the wax seal on the top was broken, but this was a very 
valuable thing, something that would, uh, some believe that it cost a, a month's salary, some believe it could even cost a year's salary for an average person. And so uh, this alabaster box being brought to Jesus, she was seeking him out for the purpose of worship, giving him what he deserves. It wasn't a sinful thing she was looking for. It wasn't a, uh, it wasn't just for a way out. It wasn't for any other reason than to uh, give Jesus what he deserves. So we see this sinner, this, uh, this uh, wicked woman seeking him out. We see, second of all, her submission to him. And by the way, as we go through all of these things that we see unfolding in her actions and in the things that she was saying, we see a perfect picture of what true repentance is all about. We see her submission, it says, uh, uh, and stood at his feet. This, uh, this uh, word uh, that, that we see here, the word stood, it doesn't necessarily mean what we would recognize it as today. Uh, the word stood in, in its original Greek form is also translated into the word abide, continue, or wait. Uh, the word stood could, uh, could be pictured in our mind as she stood by or uh, she stood waiting or uh, she continued in that space until the next events took place. This place, as she stood at his feet, this is, uh, we've heard, and I've preached before, and others have, uh, uh, when you talk about the washing of the saints' feet and that ordinance and uh, how it's a, it's a picture of submission and uh, of humility. The, the servant, the lowest servant in the household, it was their job to wash uh, the feet of any visitor that came into the home. And so this woman came and waited and she stood at his feet or she waited or continued in that place. Uh, she abode in that place, that place of a servant. It's a picture of her personal recognition of both his majesty and her lowliness. So she sought him out. She responded when she got there uh, with, uh, with submission and, he, uh, and stood at his feet behind him. Those word, two words behind him uh, give us a picture of the shame that she felt. So if you can imagine, uh, she comes into the room. Jesus is sitting there fellowshipping with, the, uh, with those that are there at the table. He's eating with them. He's telling them truth and he's instructing them. And uh, Jesus is ministering, performing his earthly ministry there in the home of that Pharisee. And this woman comes in and she's, she's waiting behind him at his feet and uh, she, uh, she recognizes, she is submissive and, and she's, uh, she's shown up for the purpose of worshiping him and, uh, and uh, we also see that she is overcome with the shame. She knows the sin that she's been involved in. She knows her, uh, that she is unworthy. She knows uh, the great amount of guilt that she has in her life based on her own personal choices. And so her shame can be seen in the fact that she stood behind him. She felt unworthy to be in his presence. She felt unworthy to look him in the eye face to face. She felt unworthy even to request his attention. So she stood by, she waited, she continued in that place as she comes in the rooms and, and sees Jesus talking, oh, I can't look him in the face, I'm so ashamed, I can't interrupt him, I'm unworthy to even be in his presence. So she stood behind him and then we see her sorrow. She wept. As I've already mentioned, this is a perfect picture of, of what true repentance is all about. True repentance uh, requires us submitting to his authority, recognizing our lowliness and his majesty. True repentance involves shame. I am unworthy of God's perfect heaven. I am unworthy of forgiveness. I am unworthy of anything good. I am a sinner. True repentance requires sorrow. And she stood at his feet behind him, weeping. Her sorrow was a result of being overwhelmed by her own guilt. Her sorrow was 
expressed as a result of her being overcome by his glory. And then she responded with service. And stood at his feet behind him weeping and began to wash his feet. This picture of lowliness, this picture of submission, this picture of sorrow, this picture of a person being uh, consumed with the majesty of God and their own personal lowliness that they're, uh, as she's sitting there and uh, Try to picture with me uh, what's taking place as he's sitting there. It wasn't like he was sitting at a table like maybe we would be sitting at a table. It was uh, in those days, it was customary. They would sit on the floor and they would kind of uh, recline themselves sideways. They would sit on one side or the other with their, uh, with their legs out to one side and to save room, they would, uh, they would bend their legs. So you can imagine he's kind of uh, sitting on, on this part of his body, is, uh, being propped up on his, on, his, uh, on his hand and his feet are kind of behind him. And, and as she walks in the room, she uh, sees him. She sees Jesus, the, uh, the one who has been preaching and testifying and performing miracles and forgiving people of their sins. And she's overwhelmed with his goodness and his greatness and the majesty of who and what Jesus is. And so uh, she uh, feels shame and she feels um, uh, as though she should uh, approach him in a submissive attitude. And, and as she uh, approaches him with this submissive attitude, she's overwhelmed with her own guilt and his glory and responds by beginning to wash his feet. Again, not calling his attention. I'm unworthy to even be in his presence. I'm unworthy to interrupt what it is that he's trying to do. This is his earthly ministry. I'm unworthy of, of even looking him in the eye. And so as she is weeping, she kneels down and begins to wash his feet with her hair as she is weeping with her tears. We understand and recognize that you're not going to get a whole lot of foot washing done with just a couple of alligator tears, right? Crocodile tears. She's boo-hooing. She is absolutely broken. She begins to wash his feet. Again, picture of submission, picture of his authority. But we can see her sincerity as she is washing his feet with her tears, wiping them with the hair on her head, and kissing his feet. Now, if my wife was in here, she would give me a hearty amen. Feet are disgusting. Amen? You, you can imagine, this is, uh, they're walking around wearing sandals, their feet exposed to the elements and how filthy and gross that they would be. And she isn't doing it simply because Jesus has told her to and instituted that ordinance uh, that, 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 we, uh, that we perform. No, this is something she is doing on her own. She's taking the role of a servant. She's so overwhelmed with his goodness and greatness that while he's not even paying her any attention, although he knew exactly what was going on, uh, she begins to wash his feet as she is booing, crying, great tears and washing his feet with her hair and kissing his feet. Now that's, to us that would be disgusting. And, I, and, and you could say that and I would say amen. But if we can't get past the, the, that picture of it and see the sincerity of our heart and see the worthiness. If we couldn't recognize, if we were in that position where we come up behind our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and see him fellowshipping with others, if we can't understand why she would be so consumed uh, with guilt and, um, and service towards him and uh, that she would wash his feet with her hair and her tears and begin to kiss his feet. If we can't see why she would respond that way, I think there's a little bit something wrong with our view of who and what Jesus Christ is. 
1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 15 gives us the understanding, and, and it's still that way today. It always has been that way. Uh, it says, if a woman have long hair, it, it is a glory to her. It, it's, she didn't care about the rest of those that were there. She didn't care about the Pharisee, his family, any of the other Pharisees. She didn't care about any other, any other guests that may have shown up during that time. Uh, she didn't care about the, uh, her, the way that her makeup looked, the way that her hair was. She didn't care what other people were going to think of her. She was so consumed with the presence of Jesus Christ that, uh, that her tears, uh, with her tears and with her hair, began to wash his feet. Now, you can imagine, try, try to imagine as she gets done, her hair is a hot mess, right? Yeah, but she didn't care. It wasn't, it wasn't uh, uh, for those that were around to see what was taking place. It was, uh, it was a result of her uh, all-consuming understanding of who and what Jesus is and what he could do and what he could do for her and her life. It's also a picture of the sacrifice that she made. She anointed his feet with the ointment. Beautiful picture. But we see the problem, uh, the problem arising in the, the mind of the Pharisee. When this Pharisee, Simon, had, that he, he's the one who invited Jesus into his home, when, uh, when he sees this unfolding before his eyes, this woman who is, who is touching him and this woman who has uh, got this horrible reputation and this is supposed to be the Messiah, this is supposed to be uh, the, the Christ, this is supposed to be uh, this amazing prophet, this, uh, this man of God, and yet this wicked, evil woman, this person who, who, who has no morals about herself, he's allowing her to touch him. And that's all he focuses on. I believe with all my heart that we live uh, in a day where the majority of the church has got the same mindset that the Pharisees had. Where we get so fixated on, uh, on the letter of the law or what we have a preconceived notion as to the way things ought to be that we lose sight and we lose focus of the fact that Jesus has uh, done so much for us, that he has promised us uh, so many great and awesome things, that he has given us a call to go and to teach. And it's not just for those who have a good bank account or who look and talk or smell uh, or act in the same way that we do. The, the gospel message is for absolutely everybody. But the Pharisee said, look, if he was in his own mind, he said, if this guy was the prophet that he claimed to be, surely he wouldn't be letting this woman touch him. I mean, after all, she's a sinner. Can I remind you that every one of us fit in the last three words of verse 39? All of us are sinners. None of us are innocent. None of us in and of ourselves do anything good, anything righteous. We're all sinners. His unspoken doubt as he's pondering in his own mind of whether or not Jesus could possibly be this prophet. We also see his unquestionable disdain for the woman. We know, and even the Pharisee knew, according to Old Testament, that the Messiah was the hope for all of humanity. And if this woman, in their mind, didn't have the, the right or didn't, uh, was unable or uh, unworthy of approaching him, then if she didn't have any hope, then in his eyes, none of us would have any hope. So Jesus responds this way as, as he knows what the Pharisee Simon is thinking. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Simon, I have somewhat to say unto thee. And he saith, Master, say on. And that's where we get to our parable. There was a certain creditor which had two debtors. The one owed 500 pence and the other 50. And when they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. 
Tell me therefore, which of them will love him the most? This is an interesting parable that Jesus is, is asking, but obviously uh, it's in reference to what's taking place there. And uh, we can see based on the Pharisee's uh, response that he didn't really recognize. He didn't really completely comprehend what it was Jesus was asking because uh, he responds. Simon answers and said, I suppose that he to whom he forgave the most. And he said unto them, thou hast rightly judged. This isn't a this isn't Jesus saying that's the right answer. You understand that. You have rightly judged. You have taken the, uh, the message. You have taken the, uh, the basics and used, uh, uh, used human logic and, and judged based on what you see happening here. Uh, that, that Obviously, uh, there was one that would love more. But the reality is both of those that have been forgiven should love him the same. Both of them have been forgiven uh, of a debt that they couldn't, uh, they couldn't afford, that they couldn't pay back. Uh, two were in debt. Two were unable to pay. And two were forgiven of the debt. The answer was obvious to Simon. Which one loves the most? Well, it's got to be the one that's been forgiven of the most. Understand in this parable, it's obvious to us, it's... Uh, the two that were in debt, he's speaking of Simon and he's speaking of the woman that was, uh, uh, that was a sinner and that was living this horrible life that was overwhelmed and consumed with who and what Jesus is. One of them responded to the presence of Jesus Christ with an overflow of worship and praise. And one of them responded to the presence of Jesus by questioning and doubting whether or not he was who he says he was, that he, who he says he was. All of us are in debt. All of us have a sin debt. All of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Just like the two that are in the story, we all are unable to pay for our escape with our life or with our actions or with the things that we do, the amount of money that we have, the amount of sacrifices that we make, none of us can pay the debt that we owe. All of us stand in need of forgiveness. So as Jesus is giving this parable, Simon gives the answer, it's got to be the guy who is forgiven of the most. Verse 44, and he, Jesus, turned to the woman and said to Simon. So he turns to face this woman who's broken, worshiping, praising, recognizing her uh, unworthiness of being in his presence and unworthiness of anything good from him. She is in full understanding of her sin and the, the debt that she owes and she's so consumed with that that she's uh, performing this act of, uh, of submission and worship. And as he's looking at her, he addresses Simon. He says, Simon, when you invited me into your home, you didn't get any water to wash my feet. And yet this woman, who is a sinner, she doesn't just give me the water. The water is coming from her eyes. She's so broken that uh, tears, great tears are flowing from her face. So much tears that she uses them to wash my feet and, and to dry them. You didn't offer the, uh, the towel. You didn't offer anything to take care of that. No, uh, she takes, because there's nothing there, she takes her own hair and is wiping the dirt and uh, the soot off of my feet. Simon, when I came into your home, you didn't greet me with that holy kiss. By the way, I'm thankful that that's not a custom in the United States. But it was here. You didn't greet me with a kiss. But this woman, since the time I came in, hath not ceased to kiss my feet. This isn't a show of, of uh, uh, 
It wasn't Jesus showing off or commanding. It wasn't anything of that nature. This wasn't her uh, in any way showing an, an attraction. None of those things are, are what's taking place here. She is so consumed as she's washing his feet and she recognizes who and what Jesus is uh, that she begins to kiss his feet while she is washing them. Can you, can you imagine that amount of worship? That amount of praise and adoration, that amount of, uh, of, uh, of love. You didn't greet me with a holy kiss, but this, this woman hasn't stopped kissing my feet since the moment I came into the house. Simon, you didn't anoint my head with oil and ointment when I came in, which was customary. But this woman has anointed my feet with the ointment. So Jesus is drawing a distinction between the two. As far as this sinful woman, this sinner is concerned, she understood. She understood her debt, the amount of sin that she was guilty of. She understood her need. She understood that she needed a Savior. She needed the Messiah. If there was going to be any hope for her at all, she had to have her sins forgiven. She understood her eternity. And because of that, she recognized Jesus as her only hope. The sinner understood, the self-righteous underestimated. The sinner understood her debt, and the self-righteous Pharisee underestimated his debt. Well, I may be guilty, but I'm not as guilty as she is. I may have done some horrible things, but they're nowhere in comparison to what it is that she has done. See, that's been the problem with the, uh, the Pharisees all throughout the majority uh, of, uh, of what we see in history is that they're so consumed with, uh, with everybody else's sin that they downplay their own underestimate their, their own guilt and their own unworthiness uh, as far as we, we know and as far as the Bible is concerned for all of sin and come short of the glory of God and the wages of sin is death. There is none of us that are without sin according to the book of James and because of that all of us deserve judgment. She understood her debt. He underestimated his debt. She understood her need he underestimated his need. She understood what eternity would hold for her, and he underestimated it. We see this unfolding at the end. Verse 47, Wherefore I say unto thee, her sins, which are many, are forgiven. For she loved much, but to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. So he uses the, the words and the, uh, rightly, uh, the right judgment that, that uh, Simon gave concerning the parable. He used that uh, against him. He says, look, because she has been forgiven much, she's giving much. But for those who give little, it's, those who love little, it's because they've been forgiven little. He is hitting Simon the Pharisee right between the eyes with his own guilt, with his own sin, his own shame. And Jesus says to the woman, thy sins are forgiven. Verse 50, he says, thy faith has saved thee, go in peace. She experienced forgiveness. She exemplified what faith is supposed to look like. And she was ensured a future in God's perfect heaven. So what is the point of all of this parable? What is the message that Jesus is trying to get across? The Bible lets us know that uh, no man has been tempted above that which we're able, that uh, all of our sin, is, uh, there's, nothing, uh, there's nothing unique about our sin, that uh, mankind has been sinning since Adam and Eve. 
That all of us have a, have a great mountain of debt that we all have accrued over our life as a result of living for ourselves. The way that we live our lives shows whether or not we think we have been forgiven or think we've been forgiven of much. Because we're all equally on the same playing field, all of sin comes short of the glory of God. So if that's forgiven, all of us have been forgiven much. Amen? If we recognize our sin and you can sit and you can think about and you can uh, categorize and you can go through as children of God uh, and we could spend all this evening confessing different things that we have been guilty of over our life. And so if we have been forgiven, the reality is all of us have been forgiven of much. But the way that we respond to the person and the works and the presence of our Lord in our life is a perfect indication of whether or not we think we've been forgiven of much or forgiven of little. Which tells us whether or not we have been forgiven at all. That's the, that's the point that he's trying to make. Who is it that's going to respond in that way? Who's going to love me the most? It's the one who's been forgiven of the most. We don't have the same background. We don't have the same testimony. But we have the same guilt. We had the same shame. We had the same uh, testimony of living for ourselves and living in opposition to God. And because of what Jesus Christ did on Calvary, we have been set free. The grace that we sang about being greater than all of our sins has been applied to our lives, to those who have uh, uh, put their faith and their trust in Jesus Christ. And every child of God ought to be able to say, he has forgiven me of much. Don't think too highly of ourselves, right? Don't think of ourselves uh, more highly than we ought. We are all sinners, all in need of salvation, all in need of grace and of mercy. And if we make it to God's perfect heaven, it is by his goodness. Not of anything that we have done. We see in this woman, this sinful woman who is more than likely involved in a life of prostitution based on the words that are used. Everybody in town knew of her reputation. And as she heard that there was someone there that could set her free, that there was someone there that could perform a miracle in her life and possibly break the chains that she had bound herself with, she goes with the idea, she goes out and she goes seeking after him, having the, uh, the ointment in hand. She was going prepared to worship. And when she comes up behind him, so overwhelmed with her shame and so overwhelmed with her guilt and uh, what it is that she had involved herself in, that she shamefully and sorrowfully approaches Jesus from behind and before she even gets his attention, she begins to weep and those, she uses those tears in her hair to, to clean the feet of Jesus, kissing his feet. A picture of sincerity. Why would she do such a thing? Because she recognized that she had been forgiven of much. And because of that, she loved him very much. The Pharisee, the self-righteous, the one who lived his life to, uh, to make sure that his good in life outweighed his bad. I may have been forgiven. I may need forgiveness, but I don't need forgiveness like she does. And so because of that, she responds to Jesus and be, being in his presence and being in his home. She responds or he responds with a, with a judgmental attitude. In no way whatsoever do we see an individual recognizing the worth of Jesus, the personal debt and need of Jesus, and Jesus refers to that, to whom little is forgiven, same loveth little.
He addresses her. Your sins are forgiven. Can you imagine something more satisfying to a woman that's broken over her sin as she enters into the presence of God in the flesh than hearing God in the flesh say, your sins are forgiven. Your faith has saved thee. Go in peace. Is this the answer that the self-righteous received? Is this the message that he heard from the Messiah? No. His faith was little, his belief was little, his, his need and understanding of forgiveness was for very little, and as a result, he got very little out of an encounter with Jesus. Now, I know that this seems kind of fanatical, what this sinful woman did. It's something that can even, we can look at it and it's kind of cringy can be even kind of humorous when we think about how nasty feet are. Amen. I understand that. But this woman was so consumed with her love for Jesus Christ that she didn't care what others thought. She didn't care what was popular. She didn't care who was looking. She didn't care about the, uh, what was taking place, the whispering, the, uh, the murmuring that was going on around her. She was so consumed with the presence of Jesus that she was broken and immediately began to serve him. Why? Because who's forgiven of much loves much. Here's the question we have to ask ourselves this evening. What is the level of love that we're showing to our Lord and Savior? Does it, does it mirror or mimic or is there any semblance at all to what uh, this woman was doing? What she was, uh, how she was acting, her, her humility and her, her lack of pride, her, her willingness to, to serve and to be subject to him? Do we have that kind of attitude? Can the sincerity of our love for him be seen in our tears? In our service, I'm not questioning in here anybody's salvation that says that they are a blood-bought believer. But what I am saying, I'll repeat what Jesus says. Her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. Do we love him much? Or do we love him little? In Jesus' parable, he's asking the question, which debtor will love the most? It's a question we've got to ask ourselves. I'm in debt. I am guilty. He's offered forgiveness. Forgiveness. How have I responded? 